please take your seats. The program will begin momentarily. Okay. Hello, everyone. How are we doing today? Wonderful, wonderful. My name is Vanessa Ock. I am a journalist with Telemundo Network. And I'm just so excited to be here sharing this beautiful, beautiful space surrounded by the power of nature. I'm especially excited to have uh, this conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Mitch. Uh, Let me pronounce this, this right, Landrew. <laughs> Mr. Then, Mitch Landrew. That's close enough. Just don't call me late for supper. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> he's the, the former mayor of New Orleans, and right now he's the senior advisor to the president and the infrastructure coordinator. They call you the infrastructure czar. That's yeah. scary, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds, yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thank it's, you so it's, much. It's, it's great to be with you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. This place is kind of nice. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great to talk to you, uh, Mr. Landry. Okay, so, uh, so you have the great task, and, and I think the, the great responsibility also, of distributing $1.2 trillion for infrastructure projects. How is that going? It's going great. <laughs> it's going fast. Um, they, it's an open, actually, uh, before I start, Senator Rob Portman's here. Rob, raise your hand. Everybody knows his beautiful wife. My wife, Cheryl's here. And all of my great friends, Walter Isaacson, who put this place on the map with so many of you fantastic people, and it's great to, it's great to be with all of you. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because every time um, I talk to anybody in the government, I tell them what I'm about to say to you is an open book test. The answer is hurry the hell up and do more faster because um, the country has been um, working hard to get better at building things and we haven't done a good job in the last 50 years of learning how to build things fast and to build them well. And a lot of folks for many, many years across the aisle talked about trying to find a way to get America to do big things. And many presidents talked about trying to get the money together to actually do the thing because you need the money and the resources to do it. And this president and this Congress in a bipartisan way was able to put together $1.2 trillion. I really can't count up that high because I went to save a dime. <laughs> but I'm told, I'm told that that is a lot of money. Now, some people will readily point out that it's not enough money, and that is true, the infrastructure deficit, the number of things that need to be fixed versus how much money we have to fix it is, is fairly significant. But this is, by anybody's measurement, um, whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood, a really great down payment that the country has made uh, on itself. Now, um, the senator will, will, will hopefully <laughs> affirm this, and I don't really mean it in a negative way, but. There's no piece of legislation that gets put together elegantly. It is somewhat of a, of, a, of a squash. Some people say it's like washing sausage being made. So it's not as though Picasso got there early and said, look, this is the beautiful thing that we're going to draw. What eventually came together was accommodation across a lot of different uh, portfolios. And there was a, there is always a difference, irrespective of party, between what the House and how they act works with the Senate. But eventually, they came up with this bill. And this bill um, basically is an investment in rebuilding roads and bridges, airports, ports, waterways. That's mostly done through the Department of Transportation and Development in partnership with the state and local governments. But then there's a whole other piece of the bill that folks got into a discussion about, about is this traditional infrastructure? Um, because people think about roads and bridges and airports and ports and waterways. But I think everybody came to an agreement that there's more to infrastructure than just that. For example, the idea that knowledge needs to be spread widely and easily and accessible to everybody. And during COVID, which all of us experienced in a, in a terrible way, one thing that we all learned how to do together is talk to each other over these things, these machines. And the only way you could talk is if you had access to high-speed internet or some other form of technology that allowed you to talk to each other across platforms and across worlds. Uh, and what we found out, um, something we knew before but became immediately apparent and evident to us, is that if you can't access each other that way, you're not going to keep up. Or you're not going to have access to telemedicine. Or you're not going to have access to the ability to 
form in a precision way. And so the president uh, said, you know, in, in America, in the 21st century, if you want to have a growth economy, everybody has to have access to high-speed internet. So we're in the process of working through that. There are a thousand different issues that are related to the pluses and minuses of who and where and what and how, but the mission is really clear, which is to get high-speed internet to everybody in America as fast as you possibly can. And then there's a whole piece of this that has to do with clean air and clean water. And again, irrespective of the political aisle that you're on, I haven't found anybody yet that likes dirty air and dirty water. <laughs> and I think I have to say that politically, as much as I hate to admit this, because I consider myself to be a fairly decent politician, I didn't anticipate exactly how hot this was going to pop early on. Um, there are a lot of very popular things about this bill. Um, because it's an investment in our long-term future. But when we started talking recently to people, folks in rural America, white and black, about clean air and clean water, everybody in the world said, I want some of that and more of it and hurry up. And it unified the country in terms of what their response was. So this will manifest itself in a number of different ways. So when the coal industry started to, to kind of go down, a lot of folks that used to dig coal out of the ground, companies left these areas and they hoped somebody else would clean it up for them. And the federal government never went back and said, you have to clean it up. So now we have to go clean it up for them. And that is so important because um, many people don't think about it, but uh, these abandoned, these orphan wells and, right. and mines actually spew uh, methane, methane that is very, very potent uh, greenhouse yeah. gas. What is, not, what is not readily apparent to everybody in this room because these things would they weren't done out of sight and out of mind of people that did them, but they weren't done in the places where you go shopping every day. And so for folks that don't live in these areas, that didn't work in these areas, there are hundreds of thousands of what they call orphan wells, uh, which are residues from wells that drew oil and gas out of them. They're all over the, the country. They're in certain places pre-1997, 1977, and then some after. But basically, in all of the, in all of the uh, states, and the counties that produced oil and gas for us. They have these things that are left behind that are spewing methane that are dirtying the air and the water literally in people's neighborhoods. Now, I didn't know this, um, but there's actually one in downtown Los Angeles, if you can imagine that. So these things are ubiquitous and they're all over the place. So Congress said, let's go put public money into cleaning up things that people got left behind. Now, I, I, I have a, eight brothers and sisters. My mama made us clean up our room before we left and clean up after yourself and take out the garbage. Evidently, in, 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 in America, we kind of let companies kind of run away with that kind of stuff and now we have to clean it up. The same is true about abandoned mine lands. If you own any place in the country where they were digging coal, um, irrespective of what you might think about it, or where you are in the energy issue, which we can talk about, they left these things behind. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of money to clean that up and there's a lot of excitement about that. On top of that, there, is, there are huge numbers uh, of dollars that are invested in um, cleaning up the Great Lakes. And this is really exciting because everybody in the country loves this. And this is true about whether it's the Great Lakes, whether it's down in the Everglades or in Louisiana, or where it's in Chesapeake Bay, there's a lot of money to do that. There's a lot of money in, in invested in the idea of resilience, how you make things stronger so that when these bad things that we know are coming our way, that we see every day, that are, that are so often now that sometimes we get a little bit uh, maybe, you know, kind of cold about it, but the wildfires, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the idea that you ought to build back stronger and then build back like it was is really critically important. And, and I, I was going to uh, ask you that, about that, Mr. Landry. I mean, rebuilding gave us the, the very important opportunity to do it right, no? To, to rebuild uh, with sustainability in mind and to make sure that they are resilient, the investments that you are doing. So this will be like a like a very important focus of all the yeah. projects that you chose. The word that we put on that, that it's just the best word we've come up with together. Maybe there's a better word. I saw Frank Lunds today. He said he has better words for everything. So he's going to give me a better word than this. I agree with him. He's a great word man, right? Frank's a good word man. Um, is resilience. And I, I'm from Louisiana, so all of you, first of all, thank you for helping save my city and <laughs> save my state when Katrina beat us to death. But you'll remember now, Katrina, Rita, Ike, Gustav, National Recession, BP oil spill. And when that happened, when the country came to, to our rescue, which was important, um, we reminded everybody politely that it wasn't because we drank too much and had too much fun that the hurricane decided to, 
hit us because we lived in a sinful way. We do enjoy life in New Orleans. That's not why Katrina hit us. <laughs> and oh, by the way, it was, it was a bad storm. But remember, when it hit, it was, it was only a Cat 3. It wasn't a 5. Really what happened was the levees broke. It was an infrastructure failure, which everybody kind of skated past because the devastation was so dramatic. And we started to think about this idea of if you're going to build it back, don't build it back like it was. Of course. Build it back better. And what better means is means different things to different people. But you won't be surprised that the folks in Miami weren't really paying too much attention to what was going on in New Orleans, although they helped us. And I have to remind them, you know, y'all have lots of hurricanes. And then Maria came along. You remember yes. Maria, right? Yeah. And then the folks in the Northeast were like, well, that's not going to happen to us. You know, and we don't have to worry about putting, putting um, mechanical stuff on the roof and in the basement because we're OK. And then Sandy hit and reminded everybody that, oh my gosh, you know, we might want to start taking a look around who's low and who's high. So for example, in Washington, D.C., I don't want to scare all you people that are in our nation's capital, but you see that, you know that big, tall, skinny thing? What's that thing called? The Washington Memorial, <laughs> that thing. You know that thing right there? That's a burn. I don't know, you notice, what, if you ever walked up there and you go, whew, man, that was a hill. You don't even notice it because of the breadth of the landscape. That's actually a burn. That's below sea level right there. And I know you can't see over all the, all the beautiful cherry blossoms and everything, but there's a lot of water around that area. And so when people say, oh my gosh, these places where we live can't flood, Wall Street will tell you differently because Sandy showed from there all the way up to 53rd Street, everybody had water. And guess what? They didn't have electricity. Think about resilience now. And so when Senator Portman and these guys drafted this bill, they were really smart about this. And they said, well, how do you fortify the energy grid? Because they began to see all these investments kind of move in and out why they're all important. So you have that. And then the thing that's, that's going to blow the roof off of the country, not that last week didn't. I'm going to just, just leave that there. <laughs> we can talk about that later in another way. But the thing that's going to excite everybody in a positive way is our clean energy future and how we're going to get from where we are to where we know that we're going to need to be because of the impact that climate change is having on us and what that transition looks like. And that's the breadth of the 1.2 trillion bucks. And my job is pretty simple. And just to get it down to the ground and, it's, and to get people to build stuff. And it's so important because, I mean, we, in 2030, we need to cut emissions by half, and by 2050, we need to get zero emissions. So we need to move forward fast. So, so this will be a, a great platform to, to get there. Yeah, but we're having challenges right now because Putin uh, invaded the Ukraine and choked off oil and gas supply. And gas prices have gone up, and nobody in here likes paying a lot of money for gas. So people are screaming. And everybody wants a way to fix that problem. And so we're, we're battling with each other about, well, what to do now? And how do we get there while we still meet our climate goals? And that's a jump ball right now in the country. And it's a real challenge. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I think we have to get where we're going sooner rather than later because of things are getting hotter, in case everybody hasn't kept an eye on this. Yes. And, 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 and it is a challenge for us as a country to get our heads around, can we find common ground in any area if there's one where we can, this would, I would just offer it to you. This is the one, because everybody, we're in agreement in this, that, that, a, that a bumpy road's a pain in the butt. I think that polls 100% in America. Did y'all get that? That was a joke. So, <laughs> does anybody disagree with that? OK. When, when this bill was approved, uh, we were in a very different situation, uh, Mr. Landrieu. How is inflation affecting the projects? Will you have to, to cut some of the projects, or are well, you on the way to? Inflation is the number one concern of everybody in America writ large. Uh, there's no question about it. It's, it's certainly the president's number one priority. And he's doing everything he can to bring inflation down. But, but as powerful as the president of the United States is, he's just the president. Yep. Um, and it's primarily the Fed's responsibility to do what is necessary to deal with that particular issue. The president is using the power that he has to encourage Congress to help reduce prices for everyday Americans by taking action on lowering the cost of prescription drugs, for example, or making sure that health care is more affordable or having access to child care. This is an interesting debate about whether child care is infrastructure. People weird out about this a little bit. But let me connect this dot for you. Um, when people say, I don't want to spend money on child care because that's not really infrastructure and we just want to build a, a bridge, as we've been talking to people, one of my jobs is to try to take in as much good information as we can from as many people. And you look at the number of people we need in the workforce, and you see all of the women wanting to go into the workforce, many of whom, by the way, 
want to go into construction or building things or high-speed internet or the 14 different areas that I talked to you about, this is the most interesting conversation I had. I don't know, there are maybe 30 women in the room. And the room was CEOs of big companies or uh, women that were running transportation departments or architects and engineers or folks that actually calipered steel and folks that actually welded, all women. 100% of them, irrespective of their station and or class wealth, said that childcare was their number one challenge. And if they couldn't have childcare, then they couldn't get to work. And if they didn't have a way to get there, so childcare, like my brain went, well, if you were gonna solve a problem and you ask what are the things you need to solve a problem, my brain went to we've gotta figure out a way for women who wanna go into the workforce to be able to take, not, not the least of which is that sometimes a guy's responsibility, fellas, but we didn't even have that discussion. Look at that, all the eyes went up. But men can stay home and watch kids too. But the idea of, of making sure that your family is taken care of while you go to work was a component part of one of the needs to get that bridge built just like the piece of cement was. And so when you think holistically and you think about solving problems rather than ideologically, it might take you to a place where you might not have gone before. And what is the solution for that? To help pay folks to help take care of their kids. To have great child care across the country. Or to have transportation that gets people, public transportation, which Congress invested a huge amount in, to help get, get, get trains and planes and buses where they need to go, not just for folks like me that can afford a plane ticket, but for folks that maybe can just afford a bus. And make sure the bus shows on time, make sure you have a lot of them, and oh, by the way, make sure that they're, they move because they have a great battery in it that makes it go faster and more quiet. How many of y'all remember when y'all were in school and y'all were catching the bus? You get out the back door, and the bus would take off, and before you know, you felt like Linus in, in, in the Snoopy with the <laughs> stuff all over you. Does anybody, I actually remember that on the corner, right down the street from Walter's house. He lived on Galvez and Napoleon. I'm gonna tell the story of Walter. We lived three blocks from each other. And I used to catch the bus on Napoleon Avenue and Johnson to go to Jesuit High School, which was about two miles away. And I'd catch the Napoleon bus, it would take me, I'd get on the Washington bus, and then I'd walk. And I would get out the back door of the bus. You know, you can go out the front or the back. You know, it was too crowded. But as the bus would leave, this big waft of exhaust. <laughs> I think this is why I didn't do good in school, now that I'm realizing it. And if I would have done good, I should have done well. So there you go. <laughs> and I, Sister I, I, Amy would be so upset with me. And I, and I think this is one of, of the most exciting projects uh, when we were talking yeah, about it last week. Um, you are investing $500 million to help pay for schools to change from these type of buses to electric buses. So, so this is going to benefit everybody, I mean, especially yeah. those children. It's exciting. It is exciting. But there's, a, but there's a what, so not to get too in, in the weeds with you guys, but there's a what, and then there's a how. So we figured out the what, we just don't know how to do the how. And I, this is just my personal observation, and I, and I told the president this when he, when he asked somebody to ask me whether I'd, I'd consider doing this. I say, you know, it's really complicated to get the federal, state, and local governments to work well together with the private sector, the not-for-profits, the faith-based community. That's what kind of worked in New Orleans. I brought, I brought what I learned through all these catastrophic events. I was a lieutenant governor when Katrina hit. So I was, I was kind of helping the recovery on the state level, and I got to beat my head up against the wall every day, which is why I lost my hair, about <laughs> FEMA and the Stafford Act not being able to be responsive. In other words, the government I remember I had this conversation with President Bush. He came down, um, and he was in the car, and I said to him, I I got, you know, you only get to get in the car with the president like a couple times, and if you say the wrong thing, they, they stop and let you out on the corner. <laughs> so you have to be really careful. So I remember saying to him that, you know, we need Category 5 levies. Now, a Category 5 levy means that you gotta build it high enough so when a Category 5 storm comes in, it won't blow you over like the wolf in the Three Little Pigs. All right, so just think about that when you're thinking about resilience. Think about you building the, the, the house of bricks so that when the wolf blows it down, it won't crash. Category five levies are higher, and they wanted to build category three levies. Category three levies are a 100-year storm levy, and category five is a 10,000 storm. We get 10,000-year storms, but we only gave us money for, for category three, which are nice, but, but it could be better. And, when I, and, and I said, and by the way, we don't have a mechanism through the Stafford Act to do that, which is the federal act whose job it is to get into a place really quickly and get people back on their feet. But there was no mechanism for massive rebuilding 
like we have to do, like, like we did um, after World War II uh, with the Marshall Plan, which, by the way, we're going to need a, another one coming, I just predict, in the future after, we, after whatever happens in the Ukraine resolves itself. But we didn't really have a mechanism to do that. And so in, when we were rebuilding New Orleans, we had to figure out how we were going to get the federal, state, and local governments talking to each other. That wasn't easy. And then we had to get the faith-based communities and the not-for-profits you know, together to coordinate. So I brought that kind of idea to Washington, and I'm spending a lot of time doing what I call building a mousetrap. So I'm, I'm really basically only trying to do three things with a lot of help. Build a team, get the money to the ground as quickly as possible, and then tell the story, because all of you say, well, I don't see it. I don't feel it. I don't hear it. By the way, there's a roundabout out there that's getting, that y'all saw that roundabout that y'all have traffic? That's one of our projects. So don't say you don't see it. So now that you know. <laughs> That's an infrastructure project. Senator, thank you for that. Um, but that's one of them. We have 5,000 of those happening right now over 3,200 counties uh, in the country as we speak. And I was as we keep putting the money into it, the number of projects is going to grow. They're going to become more visible. I would just offer this to you as a political statement. It takes a long time to build a bridge. It only takes a day to knock one down. Just think about that. That's actually a little lesson about politics that I would just offer to you to think about. Well, of course, it is not coincidence that you are taking now the lead in, in, in these infrastructure projects uh, because you did a, a really amazing job in the rebuilding of, of New Orleans. Um, I wanted to, to, to talk to you about something that, um, I, I mean, I just don't, don't want to let you go without talking to us about your powerful book because um, I think you have such, a, such an amazing message and such a powerful message that is, is important that we remember. So during your time as a mayor, you took down four Confederate monuments. And, and the removal of these monuments generated, of course, celebration, but also um, protests and even threats on your life and, and the lives of, of the people that were doing the work and your loved ones. How was to take that decision for you? And, and were you afraid of the consequences? Um. First of all, we're going to have a longer conversation about infrastructure tomorrow night with the senator and I. We're going to get into the weeds of all this stuff, and I look forward to it, Senator, and, and thank you for that. Um, that the, <laughs> it's the right way to get into this. Um, I've spoken about this many, many times, and I, I don't mean to make anybody in the room feel uncomfortable, but uh, I have strong feelings about it, so I'll tell you what they are. Um, slavery was this nation's original sin. Um, it is not yet passed the consequences and the sequela of that. I know a lot of people think that it has. I strongly think that it has not. Um, and racism, um, our ability to see it, to understand it, to know it, to talk about it in a comfortable way, um, our inability to see other people as human beings in the fullness of, of, uh, of what God intended them to be is this nation's Achilles heel. Um, and unless until we find a way to talk to each other better about it, and to actually get through it. And I use the word through advisedly because there is no ignoring this. There is no going around it. It will be with you until we heal this wound because a wound just festers. It just gets worse. And we're in the middle of it getting worse as we, as we speak right now in, in our country. We're taking a, a fairly dramatic step backwards on, on this particular issue. You're not going to be able to get to a place where Americans are going to find that more perfect union that we all dream about, however you define that in your life. And so. That's one context. The other was, I was in the middle of rebuilding the city, and, I, and I have, I've given a lot of speeches about the New South and the rebirth of the nation and resurrection and redemption coming from the most unlikely of places, a little place like the South, which expelled four million black people, essentially, and lost all of that intellectual material, all that intellectual talent, all of that raw talent. Wenton Marcellus is now, who's my dear friend, is now playing his trumpet in Washington in a beautiful building that spent $850 million building and have thousands of jobs and sell tickets for 3,000 people every night. Everything that comes from that left with Wenton. Louis Armstrong left. Everybody left the South. And as a consequence, all y'all eat better and you play music and you dance better. And so it's a joyful thing, but we miss everybody. Um, but I want you to think about that and read The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, who I think wrote the seminal book on this, a second book cast in the last chapter is the best piece of writing I've ever read in my life, and it made me, made me cry. But um, I had given a lot of speeches about that, and when I became the mayor of the city of New Orleans, I said I wasn't going to build it back like it was. 
I was going to build it back like it should have been if we would have gotten it right the first time, which was basically a challenge for people to look in the mirror and to ask ourselves, well, what did we get wrong? See, we don't really do this very much in politics because we're worried about getting accused, and then you get thrown out of office, and then you don't have a voice, and we just do a terrible job in this country of giving ourselves the freedom to say we made a mistake. How do we fix that? Do, what does the future look like for us? What do we really want to be? What are we willing to tolerate? What do we need to tolerate in order to get better? All of those questions came up. And so as I was trying to figure out, like politicians do, how do you get a group of people who have been completely destroyed? We lost 250,000 homes, 1,800 people. We were demoralized, literally everything in the city, as Walter can attest. And those of you that came down there, everything was gone. We had to rebuild it. So how do you, how do you pick people up from that? How do you, you know, create a vision for them going forward? And you start telling these stories about how we're going to build it back better and how we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna find the parts of ourselves that were rich, that we wonderful, that we wanted to keep, but be honest enough about ourselves to push back those things that were bad about us. And I happen to think that the nation's greatest strength is diversity. And so as I was rebuilding the city and we were building back things and we were designing schools and libraries, we were designing the way streets worked, design follows intent. If your intent is to exclude, you have a street that doesn't go through it's called a suburb. When, when, you, when, you th when you think about inclusion and you're building a bridge across water, you also build public transit, unless you're afraid that somebody who doesn't look like you is going to get on that transit and come rob your house, then you don't have public transit. So design follows idea. And if the idea is inclusion, then you have open spaces, you have safe spaces, you have inviting spaces, and you have to build things that way. So the built environment, my city for me, when I was mayor, it was like a canvas. It was an orchestral piece that had not yet been written. It was a piece of art that needed to be put together through science and through technology and through politics, but essentially through the humanity of the people of New Orleans. It needed to reflect who yeah, the we didn't. Well, the city of New Orleans should reflect, we should live with integrity, I guess is the best way to say this, that you ought to be who you say you are, you ought to do what you say you're going to do, and the things that you adorn yourself with should reflect who you are. And in that regard, what happened was, and I told this story in the book, and everybody has probably heard it, but Wenton, who's my buddy, I really, I mean, I know Wenton's a great trumpet player and all that stuff, and he's a, he's a better historian than he is a trumpet player, if you can imagine that. <laughs> oh, well, he's close, Walter. But, but he's just a kid from New Orleans that I've been knowing since, I don't know, we were in, Shannon, he, he was in a play with my girlfriend when, my, with, uh, when he was 13 years old. That's literally when I met Walt, met him. And so we've been knowing each other forever, so when he comes in town, we get together and talk. But I have great admiration and respect for his his sense of design. And so I asked him to meet me with breakfast one morning. And he had done a show the night before at the Sanger Theater. And uh, he, he met me at the Starbucks on, Ex on Exposition Boulevard, right across here from the convention center. And we were yippity yapping. And you know, I was talking. And, and, he, and he asked me what, what, he, what, he, what he wanted. And I said, I want you to help me curate the 300th anniversary, which is now four years away. So this is about being early, being prepared, trying to create a vision, knowing that you need time to do it, really kind of thinking way, way, way ahead, which I would encourage all of us to do while we're busy. Instead of looking down all the time, you might want to look up a bit, think about where we're going and see if we're on the right track. That's an interesting thing that we don't do enough of. But Winton said to me, when I was asking him about can you help me, he said, I'll do that for you, but I want you to do something for me. I think this is an unfair bargain, by the way, because I was just asking him to orchestrate the 300th anniversary. <laughs> like, that doesn't take a lot of work. That's just kind of like while you're riding in your car, think a little bit, right? And he says to me, I'll do that for you, like a good friend was. He goes, but I want you to take the monuments down. That's not a fair ask. <laughs> if you think about it, just, I mean, in retrospect, death threats, all kinds of crazy stuff, four years of agony, lots of yelling and screaming, and Wenton's just, or, you know, yeah, I'll do this, do that. <laughs> and anyway, he piqued my conscience. And, uh, and I, my first, and, and he said to me, it was the next thing that he said to me that kind of exploded my brain on this, which is hard for you to understand unless you read the speech that I gave in my inaugural address as lieutenant governor that talked about the New South. And he said to me, I said, why would I do that? And he said, well, have you ever, do you know how they got up there? I said, no. He goes, do you know who put them up? I said, no. I walk by them all, all the time. He goes, I know, that's the problem. I'm going to try to help you. He said, do you know that Louis Armstrong left here? Now, I had not read yet read Isabel's book, by the way, um, about the Great Migration. But when she said that, I had given a speech about losing intellectual capital and, and raw material and talent. And, and it occurred to me 
that those monuments had served as a message that were intentionally put there to tell black people, this is not your joint. This is not your home. Even though you've lived here, we wouldn't be here without you, even though everything about New Orleans is a result of the African-American community having been brought there enslaved against their will. And all of our food, all of our music, all of our culture is, is, is completely touched in a ubiquitous way by the African-American community. And to me, it just seemed like a lie. And so I caught myself giving a speech, and then all of a sudden these monuments are right there. It made me a liar too. And I thought to myself, well, shoot, this is a real problem because this is going to make people really upset. And uh, I didn't do too much about it, but I called Walter because he's a historian. And I called Ken Burns, and I called a bunch of other people just to make sure that you know, my brain was, it doesn't usually work well anyway, but <laughs> I, I just needed to make sure that I had the history right and I understood it when I became sort of to educate myself about the lost cause, which if you have not done, you should do it because we're reliving it right now. January 6th is the lost cause. It's a, they're the same exact thing. There's nothing that's going on in the United States of America that has not gone on in the South for the past 100 years. It's the same thing, it's the same story. You had the Civil War, you had Reconstruction, and then you had the clapback. We're going through the clapback right now. You're witnessing it. There's nothing that came out of uh, President Trump's mouth that didn't come out of, of Louis Rainick's mouth or the sheriff's mouth from South Louisiana, whose name was Perez, or Bull Connor's mouth. It's all the same stuff. The language is a little bit different, but the message is kind of the same, is that we're in control and you're not. We're big, you're small. We're smart, you're not. That, that language and, and the public spaces have communicated that. Can you imagine if you're a young black kid in Lafouche Parish and you got arrested for something and you're going into the courthouse um, to be judged by a jury of your peers and there's a statue <laughs> of Jefferson Davis outside of it? I mean, think about it. Just think about that for a minute. You're thinking, oh, my chance is not very good in that building. Right? I mean, seriously. So in any event, I, I thought to myself, I, I was rebuilding the whole city, and we're rebuilding new schools and things to reflect the, the fact that Louisiana and New Orleans are going to move into the 21st century. And my commitment to all of you was that I was going to use your public money to give you back a city that reflected the best of America. That was my commitment to you. I made it publicly. And then when Winton hit me in the face with this, all of a sudden the truth of my unwillingness to confront this, because I was scared. It's scary. I know what happens when people do this, because my daddy, when he was 29 years old, voted against segregation and got pinned up that night. When my mother was home pregnant with me, with four babies, he got pinned in the elevator by Leander Perez and Louis Rannick and said, you were dead. I've lived with death threats my whole life. When I was 13 years old, my life was threatened by a woman named Sylvia Pizzo. I understand. Because this is serious, and people really mean this stuff. It's not just a whatever. Rudy Giuliani got patted on the back yesterday. This is not a pat on the back. I'm not minimizing what happened. That guy shouldn't have touched Rudy. But what I'm saying is this is a serious kind of thing that people are agenda up about this because it threatens people's control. It threatens people's identity. It, it, it threatens people's sense of patriotism you know, and, and their sense of place in the world. And so... You know, I knew as soon as he said this to me what it was going to take. And round, honestly, the first thing I did was try to figure out a way to argue myself out of it. I really was trying to do that. I had to figure out somebody else owned that property that those monuments were on. And I wasn't going to spend my time yelling at the legislature. But after I did all this research, because I went to Loyola and I did man manage to graduate from, from uh, law school and clerk for the Supreme Court. So I knew a little bit about it. But I figured out that um, I owned the property as the mayor. So you have the right to actually remove the Well, the it was, it, not only did I have the right to do it, it was only my responsibility. And if I didn't do it, nobody would ever do it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't do it now, it was never going to get done just because of the politics of it. So I, I took a long time thinking about it. And then eventually a team of people that I worked on on a lot of race issue um, were doing, um, you know, some, some racial reconciliation stuff. And we were all leaving a project behind. And I thought this would be a good project. And so the, really what happened was when Dylan Roof walked into Mother Emanuel and killed nine of our fellow Americans while they were praying and said why he did it, which was because he was a white supremacist. You know, I think the Confederacy had something to do with what was in his head. And um, they, took down the, they took down the Confederate flag, Joe Riley and, uh, and the governor, Nikki. And so a answer this question, what is, what is the difference between a Confederate flag and a Confederate monument? Nothing except that one's stone and the other's cloth. And one's easy to take down and the other's hard. But really, it's a symbol of anything different. And if it's sitting right in the city, of, in the middle of the city of New Orleans, which is one of the most Afrocentric European countries that owes its existence to African-American slaves who are from Haiti, 
how much more of a lie can you have than Robert E. Lee sitting right in the middle of it? And if you're trying to prepare your city for the 21st century and you want the country to see progress rather than regress, why would you ever leave it there? So that's just kind of where my head was. And then the rest of it was just, are you going to pull the trigger or not? And with a lot of help from a lot of people, I found the courage to say, with a, with a lot of help, um, you know, we got to take those down. And we did. But it took us two years, and there was a lot of pain and agony, and there was a lot of danger. But we got it down without anybody getting hurt. Unfortunately, Heather Heyer was killed not too long after that um, when they were trying to do it in another city. And since that time, the country has found its, its, its courage, its sticking pole, at least on this issue, to say that in this moment, although those folks were warriors who fought in the Civil War, in that action, they were not patriots. They were actually, and, and I think the historical verdict of the Civil War has been written. I do not think it's controvertible that that war was fought for the purpose of destroying the United States of America for the intentional purpose of maintaining slavery. And I know that other folks say that it was about states' rights. That argument is present today in this country, but if you're black and you live in the South, you hear states' rights in a different way. And those monuments um, were a symbol to you, an intentional political symbol that you do not belong here and that you, this place is not for you. And the absence of them actually creates a space of openness and opportunity that I think gives us another chance in America to get maybe one of the most difficult issues that we still struggle with right. And I think it was, I mean, it was absolutely courageous. And, and what you say in that speech when, um, after you removed the monuments, that, um, that you felt that you were in the right side of justice when, when you saw them come down. Um, in, the, in your book, you, you said something that I think is very important. You acknowledge that uh, to, to understand and to say this was wrong is important in order for, to heal you know, and to move forward, in, in order to move forward. And, uh, and you wrote the book a couple of years ago, and then two years ago, we have all the protests because of the death of George Floyd, and we saw all this frustration and anger coming out. Do you think that will be the result of, of not dealing with that, of not acknowledging that pain and that wound that our country still has? I just, I think that we just, I think we just have to be honest with ourselves. I mean, race is really hard for us. I'm looking around this room, and look, people, everybody in here, mostly people look white. There are a couple of people that are not white in here. Um, and, and when I say that, it kind of makes you cringe a little bit, if you're honest, because you don't, you're not really forced to wear your color. If you talk to people of color, African Americans, Hispanics, et cetera, et cetera, we kind of make them wear their color all the time. And that's what kind of privilege is. You walk through life, and you don't have anything holding you back. You have more access to wealth. You have access to wealth. You have more access to power. You really have more access to opportunity. And people you know, generally will say, gee, I got that on my own. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, I haven't gotten anything on my own in my life. Like, not one thing. I mean, I don't deserve to be sitting here. Um, and, and some of that's about race, some of it's about, you know, just yeah, the action of the birth, some of it's about your parents, some of it's about your friends. But none of us got here on our own, number one. Number two, I think it's, I think it's, it's not hard to get to the point that if you, if, unless you think you're better than somebody else because of the color of your skin, which some people may think that, you are obviously wrong. But if, if we really are a country of merit, and we are a country of exceptionalism, and we are a country of we want the best and the brightest, what kind of person says, well, only certain people that look a certain way get to be on the team? I mean, how much stuff do you really leave behind? This is what the Great Migration is about. If you go back and look at history and think about all the people that left the South and who they are, right? You know, think about just the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that left the South that had they stayed there would not have been enslaved because slavery um, was, was outlawed, but would not have had the opportunities that they have. This country wouldn't be halfway what it is today. And if you want to win the future, and if we're really competing against China, right, and we have to figure out a way to beat back Russia, we need the best and the brightest in the field. And do, do people of color really need to prove to white folks anymore that they're capable and able, that you give them a chance they're going to show up, they might beat you out, which might scare you a little bit. But the truth of the matter is they're gonna, a rising tide is going to lift all boats there. Um, and that's why I say our diversity is our strength. So we're just hurting ourselves. I mean, we're literally just hurting ourselves. And I will say this, and Walter, I'll, I'll end with this and answer questions, but this, in Mardi Gras will tell you the truth about life in New Orleans. Have any of y'all been to Mardi Gras? Yeah. All right, you need to come. All right, But every Mardi Gras crew since 1960 through today that has stayed white and male 
has gotten smaller. There are lots of reasons why people want to keep it that way. I'm not arguing that point. I'm arguing the economics of it. The ones that have stayed white and male have gotten smaller and have atrophied. The ones that have gotten browner, all right, and opened their doors up and now are multicultural have gotten bigger and more prosperous. That's true. And you know what? That's true about the economy, too. And you know what? It's true about life, and it's true about religion, and it's true about politics. Now, it is not, I say this to all my friends on the other side of the aisle, don't be afraid of this. Republicans are going to have a better, if not fairer shot at people of color as Democrats do. It is not true, my Democratic friends, that when this country becomes majority minority, that that necessarily means that ideologically this country is going to be left, right, or middle. That's not the way people think. The way, people, the way politics lines up right now around abortion, race, all the things we're fighting about right now, it, it, it is. But here's the secret. If we could ever get through that and you had a real jump ball on real ideology, you would find that everybody's the same. And whether they're black or white or brown or blue, if they had a fair and open chance, they actually may be on your side ideologically. And you know what? I'm betting that by 2040 we're going to figure that out. And if we don't, we might not be having this conversation. Because we're heading in a direction right now that obviates that conversation that we need to stop. Because we're, we're heading in a direction right now where we're not speaking well with each other and not finding common ground around the things that we need to, which is why the infrastructure bill is so important. If it doesn't do anything else, if this bill does not do anything else, it will teach you that you, there is no Democratic or Republican way to fix a damn pothole. Just fix the pothole. And it will help us find common ground across ideology. And if I don't do anything else, in this time I'm doing this, however long it's going to last, it's going to be to prove the point that we actually can do big things together. And I think that is, uh, that is so important what we, you were just saying, Mr. Landry. I mean, definitely we know that diversity actually drives innovation and growth and economic growth and entrepreneurship. And, uh, and that at the end of the day, even though we're different, we all want the same things. You know, we want to breathe clean air and to drink clean water, and we want our children to grow secure and happy and healthy. And, and in that, we can center and we can focus to, to, to move forward. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to the audience to, to ask a couple of questions. Uh, yes, you in the back. Thank you. You talked a lot about clean air, clean water. What are your thoughts about the coming court decision around EPA and, and what that will mean for your work around infrastructure? Do you know what the court's going to do? They haven't read that? How many of you? That's a, that's a very sneaky question. Um, you know the Supreme Court's in the middle of making that decisions public. That, that tendency for the last week and a half has kind of shown you what direction the court's going in. There are five of them on the court that are kind of moving really quickly to places nobody thought they would ever or should go. Um, I think one of them said something about New York can't do anything with guns. Of course, Roe versus Wade. Uh, is, is history as of, as of Friday. And by the way, if you don't know it, your entire world has changed for a whole bunch of different reasons, some of which is related to that subject matter, some of it is related to you have a court with five people on it that now have removed the guardrails of democracy for the next 30 years, essentially, um, is what the tone of that opinion tells you, not just what the answer is on that subject matter, which people really should think through. When you, when you eviscerate a constitutional right, and you say the thing that it laid on doesn't exist in the Constitution, every lawyer in America now has got to go think of, well, what else was decided that rests on that idea? As Walter reminded me today, if you think about the first, the Bill of Rights, they were all designed to give you rights against your government. And essentially, they took a constitutional right away, which, at least to my knowledge, has not been done in a long, long time. So whether it's abortion or, or same-sex marriage, or interracial marriage, or contraception, things that you ought to think about that you didn't think would ever go away, all of those things are now in play, notwithstanding the fact that the justices are saying that that might not be so. You, you remember their confirmation hearings when they said one thing and now they did another. Yeah. So I don't know why people have that much confidence that they're gonna do what they said, or that they're gonna go further that they should have. Even Justice Roberts has now called into question the, the ability for that court to engender confidence over time, which is a big issue. But anyway, they're heading in a, in a certain direction. And if you were a guessing person and a betting person, I don't know where you are on Bitcoin, but um, <laughs> that was a joke too. <laughs> you, 
But you might think that they're going to eviscerate the federal government's ability to, to address clean air and clean water, and they're going to send that back to the states too, as though the states have some great genius in how to make things better. Not so much. You might consider that it's just a means to an end, which is, in my opinion, what it is. But essentially, the best guess is they're going to say states have more freedom. And the states that have more freedom are likely to be less restrictive about dirty air and dirty water than more restrictive. So if you like dirty air and dirty water, you're about to get an opinion that says that, I guess, if you're betting. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I shouldn't try to you know, guess what the Supreme Court's going to do. Um, but if you wanted more clean air and clean water or a faster and better way to, to, to get there, you know, maybe, maybe you're not going to like what they're going to do. But we'll see. Um, I'm just as interested, by the way, from a lawyer's perspective, who's writing the opinion, the tone of the opinion, what the reasoning is for it, whether they went so far or whether they went too far. You'll notice that on the, uh, on the Roe versus Wade decision, um, the Mississippi case was only 15 weeks. They blew through that. They blew through that. This court could have acted with humility and reticence and said, which is, this is a judicial philosophy now. I'm not even talking about the issue. I'm just talking about when you're there, generally what the Supreme Court has done across Republican and Democratic uh, appointed justices who are being judicious and being humble and being thoughtful, they generally will not drive a train through a door if they think people are in the shopping mall. That's not what happened the other day. They took a, they took a, a very hot issue that, by the way, 66% of the American people disagree with, and instead of being incremental about it, even if you would have disagreed with, with where they were going, they were not humble in the way they dealt with that issue. And I think that portends, if they continue to act the way they did last week, that portends a much faster movement to a space that the country did not think that we would ever be in, much less this soon. And that is going to have all kinds of ramifications that I don't think we yet fully understand that, that are far uh, broader than just the, the issue that was decided um, that basically said there's no constitutional right um, for private reproductive health in the country. Actually, Something to think about. Mr. Lander, only three countries have done that to actually take away that right. And one, Salvador, but not here Nicaragua, in the United States. No, uh, and another country in Africa. So it's really, it's really outrageous that this is happening here. We have zero times for questions, but, uh, but I know you're going to have another talk tomorrow, so, so probably you will have the opportunity to answer some questions. So thank you so much for your leadership and, and for being so courageous and the work that you did. Thank you. <laughs>